Okay, the road to Hayek. Uh, as you might have guessed, my title is to take off from Hayek's 1944 book, The Road to Serfdom. Uh, and actually, to get it more specific, it's my road to Hayek. It's what I'll be talking about the first part of this lecture. But my road to Hayek turns out uh, that allows me, as you will see, a special perspective on, es on uh, Austrian economics. So please forgive me, if you can, for recounting my own early uh, academic experience that led me through mathematics and engineering, but ultimately to Austrian economics and business cycle theory. So a little bit of autobiographical stuff here. So why, why mathematics? Well, because I was pretty good at it. Uh, thanks mainly to the excellent teachers I had at junior high and high school and junior college. Now, junior college was, wasn't my first choice, but it was compatible for my bank account and my ongoing a uh, gas station job about a mile from that little school. <laughs> That's where I started. That's Joplin Junior College in Southwest Missouri. Housed at the time uh, in a former high school, just uh, two blocks from Main Street. So I took two semesters, I'm sorry, three semesters of calculus, each being taught by one Martha McCormick. This is a big part of my career, uh, a top-notch math teacher. I remember telling her how that beyond JUCO, that's what we call it, Joplin Junior College, JUCO, I wanted to major in math. She told me that would be a bad idea. <laughs> I thought, well, gee, I thought I was getting it, you know. But no, that's not what she meant. She, she was thinking uh, of uh, math teacher's salaries. <laughs> so don't go there, okay? But she said, you need to think about applied math. Well, all right. Like engineering. And she told me electrical engineering uses some of the most sophisticated math. That was it, okay? Well, in those days, if you lived in Missouri, and the part I lived in was Missouri, <laughs> and you want to be serious about engineering, you go to the Missouri School of Mines. Now that's M-I-N-E-S, not M-I-N-D-S. Okay. <laughs> Missouri School of Mines. And the full, the full uh, name was Missouri School of Mines and Metallurgy. Now, if you close your eyes and say that school's name to yourself two or three times, you'll know it wasn't a party school, okay? <laughs> it really wasn't. <laughs> but after graduating at the little college, that's where I went. Even though the student body at that little town of Rolla, Missouri, consisted of several thousand guys, and I was told 11 girls. Mm -hmm. Now, someone is here today from Missouri School of Mines. Where is he? There he is. Are there more girls there now? No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, at the time I graduated with a double E degree, as they say, electrical engineering. The military draft was still in play. Milton Friedman had yet to do his job of bringing it down. So rather than wait to be drafted, and that's, that's really a bad thing to do because you just wait and wait and wait, and then get drafted, okay. <laughs> So I took a commission in the Air Force, which allowed me to work in electronics. That's 
That's why. That's, that's four years worth of Air Force, but at least I was in electronics, okay? So I was assigned to a warfare electronics lab. That's not a surprise. Uh, housed in an air base uh, in upstate New York. From there, I worked long distance, thankfully, on how to deal with antique Russian radars that had been sold to the North Vietnamese. Okay, to say the least, there wasn't much high tech in it. Okay, but that's that was what I uh, learned and worked with. Uh, other things too, but similar in scope. Okay, now I didn't much enjoy my work. And in off hours, I read a lot of Erskine Caldwell novels. Now, that's not good for your mind, <laughs> okay? <laughs> but at one point, my brother, who was drafted in the Army, uh, contacted me from Vietnam. He did get drafted. And asked me to send him all of Ayn Rand's books that I could find. Well. I found Rand's books in Syracuse, uh, the bookstore there, and I bought two copies each, mailing one to my brother and reading the other. Now, I have to say that at the time I was pretty much out of my element in dealing with Rand's philosophy, warmed up to it eventually. But somehow I took an interest in The Economist that were listed uh, in the recommended biography of Ayn Rand's Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. Okay, look at, look at that list. I'll give you a, a sum of it. Starts out Ludwig von Mises, eight books. <laughs> okay, and then Henry Hazlitt, four books. Eugen von Bombeverk. Now, did Rand actually read Bombeverk? <laughs> I don't, I don't know. And still more, Benjamin Anderson, Lawrence Fertig, Harold Fleming, John T. Flynn, and others. Hayek wasn't in that bibliography. I was, I was surprised to say that when I pulled it off of my bookshelf a week or so ago. But with that list of authors, I found my way to his book. Now that was my road to Hayek, <laughs> all right? Now, I was inclined to call that even the long and winding road, but that's the Beatles, you know, so my road with Hayek, okay? I eventually met Hayek on a number of occasions on Mont Pelerin Society conferences at Institute for Humane Study conferences. Uh, I wrote my University of Virginia doctoral dissertation at IHS while uh, Hayek was in residence there. That, that was a good bump for me to, to be able to do that. But now I'm getting my story ahead here. Uh, at the end of my military service, I realized that it might not be easy to find a civilian job given what I'd been doing for four years. Uh, so under the circumstances, many of my military comrades with similar departure dates uh, registered to MBA programs. Now, that didn't appeal to me somehow. I didn't want an MBA program. But instead, I went for economics. Now, I can't say that uh, mathematics and electrical engineering pre pre prepared me for a study in economics. But here's the punchline. Here's what I can say. I can say that by not having been immersed in Keynesian economics, gave me a clear head to read and study Hayek and Mises. <laughs> Almost all the undergraduates uh, end up studying Keynes, even if it's not labeled as Keynesianism. Since then, of course, I've read Keynes, and particularly his uh, 1936 general theory, which I've read more times than I like to 
think about. <laughs> yeah. So once out of uniform, I registered for a master's degree at the University of Kansas City. I thought that I'd stay within the, the, the Missouri ga gambit uh, because I'm coming out of engineering and going into uh, graduate work in economics. Uh, it was there that for the first time I got some Keynesianism. Okay, so that's, that's my start with Keynesianism. And it was, as uh, some of you may already expect, uh, Keynesianism of the ISLM variety. How many people know what that means? Okay, good, good. IS is investment and saving, and LM is liquidity and money. There's a bunch of graphs that show how it all hangs together. Uh, also, there was some heavy doses of institutionalism uh, at Kansas City pronounced by three syllables, institutionalism. <laughs> and who is that? Thorstein Veblen and Clarence Ayers. I couldn't handle that. I just, I'm sorry. And even Marxism. Well, we know what to say about that, too. Now, there was some neoclassical micro there, some good neoclassical micro. Uh, but my focus was on macro and especially the Austrian theory of, of the business cycle. I was intrigued by the interlocking graphs of ISLM that set out the Keynesian vision but I wasn't actually won over for it. Still, though, I was intrigued. And my challenge was to create interlocking graphs that capture the Hayekian view. Nobody had tried to do that. There are graphs in Rothbard and elsewhere, but interlocking, you know, that's what you have to have going to see the full picture at once, okay? And I say that, uh, I do these graphs to capture Hayek's view. And I, I say Hayekian rather than Misesian, only because Mises didn't do graphs, thumb through human action. <laughs> you don't find them. And somewhere he wrote, I know Ebeling knows this, somewhere he wrote, graphs are only for undergraduates. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Richard will tell you where that came from. I don't know where. <laughs> and my challenge was to create interlocking graph graphics. My title was Austrian Macroeconomics and Diagrammatic Ex Exposition. I got a respectable grade from the, uh, from the professor and surprisingly he suggested that I present it at an upcoming Midwestern Economic Conference in Chicago. Well, I wasn't sure. Uh, it turns out the paper had only been read, read uh, only been read by two people, and that was my professor and, and me. Okay, so somehow I got it in my head that I needed to send the paper to Murray Rothbard. I'd read some of his too, but I'd never met him. Didn't know what he was all about uh, personally, and I did. I I did send it to. Rothbard. And in a little less than a week, the phone rang and it was Joey Rothbard. Uh, and she handed over the phone to Murray uh, right away. Uh, and we had a long talk. And it was great. You know, I, I, even while, even during the phone conversation, I thought, I'm going to Chicago. <laughs> you know? It's going to work. Okay. Uh, but at some point, uh, Murray said, will you be in New York anytime soon? I was in Kansas City. I was, I was working uh, in, in the semester. And I had no thought of going to New York or going out of state anywhere. But I had the gumption to say, I'll be there spring break. <laughs> And it worked out. I, I had a, 
I was a guest for dinner at Rothbard's apartment, and then more guests arrived with copies of the paper uh, to discuss the graphics. One of those people was Walter Block. Walter Grinder was also there and a few others. And I didn't know Murray very uh, personally at all. But uh, after dinner, we started conversations that went on and on. It was great. I mean, I wanted to hear all this stuff. Uh, and a lot of, a lot of chit chat about other people and so on during it. And I kept looking at my watch and it was midnight and then one o'clock and then two o'clock. <laughs> I kept going. And I kept trying to get my stuff together and moving towards the door and uh, nobody Nobody would recognize that. Uh, and, and essentially, I got away at 4 o'clock. <laughs> so Murray was a, it was a total night owl. Uh, but it was, a great, uh, it was a great evening for me, uh, for sure. Um, so Rothbard, you know, looking back, uh, uh, I think I, I'd be surprised that he would like that as much as he seemed to. But the reason he liked it is because he saw it beating the diagrams or beating Keynesianism at their own game. Keynesianism has all the interlocking. Well, so do we, you know. <laughs> and it tells you another story. So that, that's what he liked. And the paper eventually got published uh, as an Institute for Humane Study monograph in 80, in, in 19, 78, and also in Luis Padero's edited volume, uh, New Directions in Economic Education. And I should add, not long ago, some of those graphics made it in an appearance at a Mises Institute t-shirt, okay? <laughs> I think they might be sold out, but, you know, hey. We had him. Now, I got through Kansas City. <laughs> Here I was at University of Missouri at Kansas City, and I got through that. Let me conf confess, though, up front, that as an upstart Austrian, I wasn't always on the straight and narrow. One of my Kansas City professors was also an economist at the Kansas City Federal Reserve Bank. And after finishing my master's degree, I took a job at the Kansas City Fed. And maybe I shouldn't have mentioned that, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but the bright part of it is that I shared an office with Thomas Honig. Some of you might know who that is. Uh, he eventually became the Kansas City Fed president and later, uh, or serving on the Federal Open Market Committee, most always casting the vote no on the Fed's keeping interest rates exceedingly low. Now that, 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 that's Austrian uh, views for sure. So as you, as you know, that vice that advice was wholly compatible with the Austrian view. Honig put me on to Axel Leyenhofer. That was his hero. Uh, and that's the, the 1980s or 68 book on Keynesian economics and the economics of Keynes. And that's a great book. And, and there's a lot of Austrianism there, even though he doesn't necessarily uh, talk to it about that. I could see that Leonhoff had had a streak of Austrianism in him. And I like to think that I put Honig on Hayek. So it was after my short-lived Fed experience that on the recommendation of, guess who, Murray Rothbard, I went for the doctorate degree in, uh, at the University of Virginia. I recognized early on uh, at that very basic level that Keynesian views and 
Hayekian views were fundamentally different. In dealing with the macroeconomy, Hayek adopted a healthy approach to understanding uh, business cycles. And here's the, the quote out of Hayek. Hayek says, before we can even ask how things might go wrong, we must first explain how they could ever go right. <laughs> and as you'll see when we develop this, that's exactly what Keynes did not do. He, he forgot that part of it. How could things ever go right? By contrast, Keynes adopted a sharply different and less than helpful view. His notions seemed to embrace the view that apart from full employment happened so, that's my expression, but that's what it is. This, apart from that, the economy can languish in depression possibly for decades. And here, right out of the general theory, Keynes wrote, the rate of interest may fluctuate for decades. It's my italics. About the level which is chronically too high for full employment. So that doesn't that doesn't read that doesn't lead you to think that there's somehow it could go right. It's, it simply always goes wrong. Market failure for Keynes is hardwired into the Keynesian theory. That's sort of the bottom line. If you have a, a theory like he has, then you're not going to have any, uh, any good economics. Market failure is what you get. Okay? In my day and even now, Keynesianism, sometimes not labeled as such, you have to watch out for that, is often the first thing students learn in their macroeconomic course. And the acid test for the Keynesian view is the relative movements of consumption and investment. We'll see. Let me illustrate the world of difference between Keynes and Hayek. I'll take Keynes first. In his view, those two magnitudes, consumption and investment, can increase together, okay, or they can decrease together. But there's no scope in Keynes' theory for opposing movements of those two magnitudes, which there is in Hayek, as we'll see. But Keynes doesn't allow that at all. And, and again, once you disallow that, then you're going to have an economy in trouble. Before the students had time to think about just what Keynes' theoretical construction entails, the professor's attention is on the relative rates of downward and upward co-movements of, of consumption and investment. So I'll spare you the algebra uh, that quantifies those relative, uh, those relative rates. I'm sure you, some of you have gone through Keynesianism and they know exactly what that is. Typically, neither the student nor the professor realizes that Keynes has put consumption and investment in a straitjacket, right? Look at what happens according to Keynes if income earners begin to save more. Okay, what happens when they begin to save more? Well, I've got some pictures to show you that. Oh, I got things to write on too. That'll be good. That'll be good. I've got red and green. I think I'll use red just for danger. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> and I'll start with an economy that's just a private economy, no government spending. Okay, and and you know what that looks like. Look at the left there. I'm just saying that's that's what I'm looking at. Like y equals c plus i. We can add to that in a little bit, but now just y equals c plus i. Now. On the right, we have uh, three steps here. The first step is that we're imagining, and this happens sometimes, that saving increases. And it's because of demographics and all sorts of, it's not, it's not that people just get a big boost saying, oh, I've got to save, you know. That's not it, it's just over time, depending on the population and, and so on, then you might get more savings. 
than you've had before. So there, there is such a thing as people saving more, all right? So people saving more. Well, if they're saving more, it means they're consuming less, isn't it? So that C going down. Oh, that sort of upsets the equation. Uh, and in fact, even worse so, because according to Keynes, if people aren't going to be consuming much, well, we don't have to be producing as much. So I goes down too. But a lot of people lose their jobs and income goes down. That's the third step. So th this is the, the problem that Keynes has. In fact, he has a label for it. That you probably already know what it is. Uh, it's the paradox of thrift. Okay, because if this is what happens, then everything goes down and you tried to save, but you can't save because you don't have enough income. <laughs> okay, that was the problem. That was the problem. That's the way Keynes looked at it. Now, I could, in fact, I didn't do this uh, on, on the screen. Uh, because that's as far as it goes to show you what the problem is. And if you look at what the solution might be, or at least what the solution might be in the Keynesian view, there's one more, uh, one more thing out here, C plus I plus what? G, okay, government, okay? So you can get government and say, look here, both of these things are going down, the whole, so the whole thing's going down. We need something to go up. Well, how about G, <laughs> okay? There's G, and, and let's let it go up, and then, and then that'll fix things, all right? Oh well, boy, won't it, okay? <laughs> and the way, the way you see it, you can see it two different ways, and in reading Keynes, you're not quite sure which way he's thinking, but neither one of them works. One is that, if you, if you have to, all this G to, to fix the picture, to fix the whole thing, uh, you need to get some money for it. And if you get it from taxes, it comes out of Y, then after tax Y is going to be way down. Now that's, that's not going to work very well. Okay. And the alternative, of course, is getting the, getting the G from the central bank. And if you do that, it seems okay for a while, all right? Seems okay for a while. But that's what, that's what gets you into a business cycle, all right? So there's nothing I could put there that would show you how, okay, this will fix it. This will work out right. It ain't going to happen. It's just a question of which, which way do you try to do it and, and what's the outcome, okay? So G to the... Government to the rescue just isn't going to do it, all right? Okay, people may lower their consumption in order to save more. And then that, there's the C plus I. Uh, and with I and then Y going down, you have trouble saving. This is Keynesian's paradox of thrift, okay? Hayek didn't have any paradox of thrift. Okay, now we put G in the picture. And it turns out here that uh, if, if that's what you do, then you get an artificial boom or, uh, or other problems all along. So Keynes' vision is very different than Hayek. Normally, it's in, this is in Keynes, or at least frequently, and for long periods, the economy is inside the production possibilities frontier. Well, we know how that, how that goes. And it looks like that. That there's no, there's no way that it can move along the frontier. Right? It's either inside the frontier, uh, or it could be going up towards the frontier, but if it happens to hit the frontier, well, that's a miracle. I mean, there's just, there was no way that it would do that except just by uh, happen so from Keynes. 
So the co-movements of C and I consist of movements inward away from the frontier and outward towards the frontier. Or with the central bank's help beyond the frontier, but only in, norm, in nominal terms, that is, inflation, which eventually gives you the whole uh, business cycle business, okay? Keynes theory simply doesn't allow for opposing movements of consumption and investment. Consuming less and investing more in order to have increased C in the future. That just doesn't happen. It does, it does happen in Hayek. And so now I show you the, the, what Hayek would be doing. So, so we're going to contrast this view with Hayek. Uh, showing here how in Austrian theory, op opposing movements can actually happen when the, there's increased saving behavior and showing that the market economy can stay out of the Keynesian uh, straitjacket, okay? We add a temporal dimension to the investment and we allow for some entrepreneurship. That's not a hard thing to do, allow for some entrepreneurship. So first, let's look at the loanable funds market, uh, which reacts to the increase in saving. S shifts, saving shifts to the right, lowering interest rates. You're all familiar with that. If I just, if I just do the loanable funds market, it looks like that. But uh, if people save more, it just means that curve shapes, goes to the right, like so. Well, okay, it goes to the right, uh, but it, that, that causes it to lower interest rates, right? And so that's, that's the thing that is in play here that is not in play in any meaningful sense in Keynes's view uh, of these matters, okay? Now, so you see that, the, that you have the economics to get uh, more investment and less consumption, but there's a time element here, and of course that, that turns out to be the Hayekian triangle. Now before I show a Hayekian triangle, uh, I have to say that my triangle looks different than Hayek's. It still has three sides, okay? <laughs> but different. And the difference is, if you read prices in production, that for some reason, and I think I can guess what the reason is, Hayek had time coming down the vertical axis, okay? And I claim, if, if someone knows I'm wrong, please tell me, I claim that's the only graph in all of economics that has time coming down the vertical axis. <laughs> it makes you wonder what happens to time when it hits the origin. Okay. <laughs> it, it just doesn't commute, doesn't, can't think of it that way, okay? And so it, it's an easy fix. You just, you just yank the triangle around where time goes left to right, <laughs> and that's the way it works. So don't get upset if it's, if it's my triangle and not the Hayekian triangle. So here's our triangle. Kind of cro crooked, okay, it looks, it looks good, okay. That's the Hayekian triangle, and if you, if you insist on flipping it around and looking like Hayek, that's fine, but that's, that's the triangle. And uh, again, in this picture, we see that uh, if people really want to save more, they mean they, it means they consume less, right? They consume less. And so that's the arrow that shows they're really going you know, to reduce consumption. Now, as Keynes would have had it, that meant, okay, it means reduced investment as well. No, it doesn't work that way, precisely because, as you saw with the loanable funds market, the interest rate is lower. And if the interest rate is lower, that makes 
longer term projects uh, more profitable. Okay, you, you don't have to you don't have to spend too much money with interest because they're lower now. So when that happens, uh, what we get is a, a new triangle. But okay, if people aren't consuming currently the consumer goods, uh, then we can use our monies to to increase investment in the in earlier stages, and it'll still be profitable, all right? And in fact, if you look at the triangles, uh, I've, I've shown it so that you get more investment than you lost. You, you lost some investment in the upper stage, but you got more investment in the lower stages. Because when people are saving more, then that, that leaves a lot of stuff they're working and making uh, available for use in uh, the triangle, all right? So that's, that's the way that works. So anyhow, Keynes' focus then uh, has him missing the cause of the economic downturns. Uh, I can best introduce, here's, here's directly from the general theory. And, and just think about it and see if you think it makes any sense. He says, I can best introduce what I have to say about depressions, about downturns, by beginning with the later stages of the boom and the outset of the crisis. No, he's already missed the boat at that point. <laughs> he needs to look at the early stages and see what happens there. And that's where all, all of the problems are created. And, and then... Near the crisis, you know, you get, you get the crisis. But he, he says he wants to look at the beginning of it. So here, apart from psychological factors, the early and middle stages of the boom had no acclaim on his attention. Right? It's, worth, it's worth noting that Friedman, too, points to a, a normal or ordinary downturn of, I've got books where I always underline those, those kinds of words. What does it mean, a normal downturn? Or ordinary, just an ordinary downturn. Which, which is to say, we're not going to bother with thinking about that. It's a normal downturn. Okay? And then deals with the slide into deep depression, which is characterized with massive uncertainty, hoarding behavior, and ill-conceived government programs, right? Uh, mm. So in contrast, Hayek focuses on the dynamics of the inflationary central bank's unsustainable boom, which leads to a crisis. And I've heard uh, Hayek say that when he used that term crisis in this in this context, he didn't mean the entire falling to a deep level of the economy. He didn't mean that. The crisis was simply uh, the economy has quit going up and has started going down. And the whole notion about the interest rate effect is what gives that, uh, what gives that to us. We know that if you have the interest rate too low, then uh, you have too much uh, early stage investment and you run out of, uh, you're, you're, yeah, you're right. <laughs> you run out of stuff in order to finish, okay? And so, uh, and so that's the crisis, right? Uh, and it's, it's another thing about what happens all the way down. Uh, it's the same things I mentioned a minute ago. There's massive uncertainties. Well, we know why that is. Hoarding behavior, ill-conceived government programs. So it, it snowballs. It gets worse and worse because people are doing their own things to try to, to, try to fix it. Okay. So in contrast... Hayek focuses on the dynamics of inflationary 
central bank's unsustainable boom that leads to a crisis, again, causes it to start to turn down. Uh, and that means that initial downturn, okay? Let me recognize that Keynes and Hayek, face to face, were always collegial with one another. But the writings uh, elsewhere, not so much. And I'll just, I'll just mention two to give, you, to give you the flavor. One has to do with uh, the concept of forced savings. And this is mentioned in the general theory. And if any of you have worked for that term, you got to be real careful uh, and decide which of the half dozen meanings that that's supposed to have, <laughs> okay? Because it's, it's not clear just what forced saving means uh, in this context. Uh, and that's the phrase that Hayek used. Uh, and he and others had a meaning to it that seems almost, well, more than almost counter to the idea of forced savings. And it goes like this. Uh, Hayek has explained in a footnote, I guess he realized that term isn't exactly right, but he has in a footnote that forced saving, uh, what it means is despite they're using any actual savings, so it's, that's not for people aren't people aren't forced to save literally. Uh, that could carry the investment to comp to completion. So it, it turns out that that in the early stages, too much stuff is being used. That that could be called real force saving, as opposed to handing over the money as, as savings. So that real force savings means that people are building too many things at the early stages and they're gonna run out and it's not gonna work and you're gonna have a downturn. That's what it means, okay? And so the question we could ask Keynes, and we're happy to get an answer because we just need to know, uh, so let me recognize, let's see. Okay, I say one issue in the general theory focuses on the increase in the quantity of money that supposedly causes forced savings, okay? Well, we've gone through, we know what it actually means. So if we ask Keynes what that means, here's, here's what he says. You need to write this down because he says that in the general theory at the time where he's asked, uh, what can you say about forced savings, okay? And here it is. He says, at this point, we're in deep water. The wild duck has dived down to the bottom as deep as she can get, and bitten fast hold of the weed and stangle and all the rubbish that's down there. And it would take an extraordinary clever dog to dive down and fish her up again. <laughs> Now, I mentioned Lanhuffet before. I have it from Lanhuffet. He says this is an obvious reference to Keynes. You got to, I didn't pick that up the first time I read it in general theory. But I think, I think Lanhuffet was right, that he knew that Keynes used forced savings. And he, he knew that the Austrian theory was a bunch of bunk. He didn't like it. And so that's, that's what he said. That was... Keynes' uh, reason there, okay? So now let me offer a tucked away passage in Hayek's pure theory of capital. And in fact, it's in the part of that theory where capital isn't that pure, okay? Near the end of the book. But uh, here's what Keynes says. It's not surprising that Mr. Keynes finds his view anticipated by the mercantilist writers and gifted amateurs. Concern with the surface phenomenon, surface phenomenon has always marked the first stage of the scientific approach to our subject. But it is alarming to see that after we have gone through 
the process of developing systematic account of those factors, which in the long term determine prices and production, we are now called upon to scrap it in order to replace it by the short-sighted philosophy of a businessman raised to the digni dignity of a science. <laughs> That's what he had to say about Keynes' general theory. <clears throat> now, I've allowed, allowed myself enough time to say something about Friedman and Hayek. Uh, and here I'm going to quote Friedman in his 1963 monetary history of the United States. And this is something he, he just blurted out in, uh, in one of his chapters. And he says, what, what he was talking about is how deviations of interest rates can or maybe can't influence much. You know, they go up and down, but not very much, just about like this, you know, something like that. And so Friedman th says, it's a sound general pr uh, principle that great events have great origins. Now, I, I'd say independent of the context, that's not true. <laughs> that's just not true. But that's what he says. Uh, and he goes on to, to say, well, yeah, sometimes there might be, but I guess he didn't want to apply it to changes in the interest rate. And we have to recognize that, that sometimes there, there are great events and great origins. Uh, volcanoes dumping on cities, for instance. Volcanoes are a big cause and destruction of the city is a big effect. But apart from that, we've, we've got a lot of leeway in between. And I write here that now in, in a follow-up, in the same paragraph, they do a little whistling in the dark. In other words, you know, it's a sound, it's a sound principle, but not quite sure. Now, I'm going to jump now from uh, Friedman to Robert Lucas, who made something out of this. And Lucas, we can we can call him a monetarist if we choose. He's we say who's new classes. Classicism is a dynamic general equilibrium vision of Friedman's monetarism, okay, that he shares with Friedman and Schwartz. So they're both in the same tract, okay? And he endorses this view about you have to have big, big causes and big effect, uh, and without any whistling. There's no question about it to him. Uh, it says, the magnitude of the cause alleged by the Austrians, this is, this is uh, Lucas, my rendition, uh, a policy-induced decrease in interest rate is so small about that, compared to the magnitude of the alleged effect, uh, a dramatic economy-wide downturn, that Austrian theory of boom and bust cannot be entertained, period. Okay? And now in his own words, and you'll see I'm saying the same the same thing, he just writes a little differently. Given the cyclical amplitude of interest rates, the investment interest elasticity needed to account for the observed magnitude in investment is much too high, and it's his uh, italics, much too high to be consistent with other evidence. So out with the Austrians, they need to be saying those things that they've been saying for years. Now, uh, in an article, a chapter that I contributed to um, a book on Keynesianism, uh, I claimed that, there are, that he's wrong for th on three counts. 
And yet in, in getting ready for this lecture, I realized that, that I'd made a mistake. There are four counts, okay? There are four counts. And it, go, it goes like this. The first count is his failing to recognize that small persistent, persistent causes can have large effects. And that's, that's easy to recognize. Two, he thinks of interest elasticity of investment as a whole. Interest elasticity of investment as a whole. Okay. Rather than divergent interest elasticities of early stage and late stage uh, investment goods. In fact, that's what causes the problem. You get too much stuff in the early stages and not enough stuff in later stages. Right? And if you try to if you try to quantify the elasticity as a whole bunch, well, you'll miss, you'll miss the problem, all right? So that's number two, he's wrong about that. And thirdly, he takes effect, the effect, to be the entire peak to trough, a movement that will invariably entail complicated factors, including ill-conceived policies aimed at rekindling kindling the blue, the, the boom. And now here, we go back to this business about the crisis. He's not talking about the whole shebang. He's talking about the downturn, which can get amplified by a lot of things that go wrong and a lot of things that go stupid uh, with the government trying to, doing all the wrong things to to solve the problem, it makes the problem worse. So that's the third thing. And now the fourth thing, see, he's, he's talking about relative movements. What about that movement in interest rate as opposed to the movement uh, top to bottom uh, to the Depression? He fails to realize that even if the Federal Reserve just kept interest rates from rising when market forces were pressing upwards, that too would trigger the eventual downturn. That's what I claim. Uh, and yet, if, if Lucas tried to do his math, you'd have trouble because there wasn't any change in the interest rate. <laughs> but if, if there was a change in market forces that isn't isn't detected, nobody knows just what that was, then uh, his results just have, are meaningless, okay? There wasn't, wasn't any change in the interest rate, but there should have been, and it should have been allowed if market forces were, were pushing upward. Okay, that's where I'm quitting. Okay. Thank you very much.